All right, we're going to get started, um, and I appreciate that you all made it here, and maybe had to chip away the ice to open the doors of your car. I did. It took me a little bit longer to get here because I had to wait for my window to Welcome get, to you know, no, no, it's okay. There was no snow, or there wasn't any ice on our driveway, so we're fine. So, you know, this whole series of epiphany, Fetch. Rob and I have been talking about Fetch. Paul. The people who have shifted. Fetch. Paul. Yeah. No. Ellen's going to take care of that for us in a minute. Paul. Um, but if I turn Paul. it down, I could. Oh. There Paul. we go. Okay. Paul. She'll be turning that off. Um, so we've shared, I shared about my grandparents uh, last time I taught and uh, the time before that I talked about the poets that had, and their poetry um, that had influenced me. So today I wanted to talk about the ancients that go back as far as St. Benedict who really if you think about it his work was in the 5th and 6th century and amazing that we still call it the the rule is what benedict gave us um and i think um what i love about the people that i've chosen to share with you today is because uh, some of what they did they did in community and community is a huge part of why i'm a priest today and it's a huge way that it's kept me sane and steady and um here, like even just in the world, I, I got my cues from the communities that surrounded me as a child. I, uh, I didn't come from a very stable household, and so I looked for those cues wherever I could find them, and they continue to influence me today. And Benedict is one. Um, I also like all of these folks. The other commonality that they have with my life is they're a bit oppositional. The church wasn't sure what to do with them in their own day. In fact, many of them were censured for a while. Uh, many of them were, were thrown out. One went on to form the Jesuits. I mean, look, this is, they have survived the test of time. And I love that they pushed enough to hear God speaking and they were resilient and believed strongly in God's message to them so that they could continue their work. I find that to be the most appealing, maybe the most appealing part of it, that for, for most of their, for all of their lives, they kind of operated outside of the church. And you remember at that time, there was just one church. There wasn't the branch down the street and the other one across the street. I mean, there was the Eastern church and the Western church, but that wasn't even until the ninth century, friends. So when Benedict was doing his thing, there was basically one Christian church, right? And, and with its many forms uh, based on geography and culture and so on. But so uh, there you even have a little picture of him there. I'm going to share my screen. I think I am. I hope this is the right screen. You can see my grocery list instead. Okay. This is the prayer for um, that's found in our book called Holy Men and Holy Women. It's a book of saints that we use every day to kind of direct our lives, pray about them. This is the collect for Benedict. Almighty and everlasting God, your precepts are the wisdom of a loving father. Give us grace, following the teaching and example of your servant Benedict, to walk with loving and willing hearts in the school of the Lord's service. Let your ears be open to our prayers and prosper with your blessing the work of our hands. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So Benedict's claim to fame is that maybe he's called the father of Western monasticism, meaning he founded a monastery, but he didn't know he'd founded a monastery. Uh, that, that's like uh, painters getting their reward of $2 billion paintings long, long, long after their uh, time on the earth. Uh, so Benedict, 
was unhappy with the way that, that he saw the church was being run. Can you imagine that? And his, uh, he fled to some remote location in the mountains in order to sort of renew his relationship with God through work and study and prayer. And those basically are the rule. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but um, he did uh, establish later in life this community in Monte Cassino, which still exists today. You are probably world travelers here and probably may have seen it. I've seen pictures of the pictures of it. Okay. Let's turn the page here, see what else I can tell you about our friend St. Benedict. He does not ever appear to have been ordained or to even contemplated founding an order, and he died somewhere between 540 and 550 and buried in the same, sister, uh, the same grave as his sister Scholastica. Uh, let's see. There's some argument about really was this Benedict's rule or was this some other dude's rule? I don't know that we'll ever know that. Maybe you can ask when you get to heaven if that's really your burning question when you, when you get there, who was first uh, in that. But in any case, his is the one that stuck. And I'm sure uh, from God's point of view, however it came to be, I bet God gives thanks for that all the time because this way of being in community together uh, has really survived the centuries, as I've said earlier, um, and that it still exists. The Benedictine order, as you know, there's an order in the Episcopal Church, there's an order in the Catholic Church, so it doesn't, it's not just Catholics who can be, take vows, the vows would be uh, stability, amendment of life, and obedience. And for someone who, uh, flinches a bit every time the word obedience flies around the room. That would be me. Um, I have learned a lot from Benedict and that obedience to God uh, and the idea that it's possible. It's possible to be obedient. Um, so it's amazing, though, in the 50 years beyond his passing, the church recognized the benefit of the order and the rule and uh, it seems he sent Augustine and his companions to England, if you remember that. He was, Augustine was the first Archbishop of Canterbury. So you have to really know your church history here, but uh, he took the rule with him in his, as he began to convert uh, those wicked Anglo-Saxon pagans uh, into Christians. So what is the rule? The rule of St. Benedict. How much of how how many of you have heard of this this thing I'm talking of the rule? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Um, it's often called the little rule for beginners. So if that if it's terrifying, if you think this can't be for me, oh no, it's in the name. And uh, and uh, I'm thinking of a little book called Always We Begin Again, uh, written by a lawyer in Mississippi. Um, and 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 a good Episcopal churchman uh, and it's, it's that idea that every day we begin again. And I think that's exactly what attracted me to the rule and what keeps me attached to the rule is this idea that we begin again. That yes, there may be things, things I need to, to, to pray about, to ask forgiveness for, uh, redemptive work that I need to do, but God has already done that work in me and uh, I get to accept that. And I think the rule helps me accept it. Now, how is that? because it's supposed to suggest a balance. I, sometimes we use that word uh, if that's even possible, but the idea is that there's a balance between work and study and community, and that somehow in that mix, that we're not doing one over another, that we're finding our path through this order of prayer, mostly. And um, uh, I rediscovered that in seminary because seminary life, most residential seminaries are, bound, are, are founded on the rule that there is a balance between morning prayer, study, work in the community, noonday prayers, evening prayer, Compline, right? And Eucharist sometimes during that week. 
and then living with others in close-knit circumstances, just like middle school, but worse, because people are grown up. <laughs> but um, it is good. I think it is good. It was good. Um, I didn't think I understood it that way then. I, I had a family, you know, in seminary of two kids. They were fifth grade and 11th grade when we got there. And so that was a lot just to manage my family and the changes around that. So, but I came to rely on my community again, as I did when I was a child, my church community, uh, to support and uphold my family and to uphold me. And that knowing that regularity and the ease at which I could encounter it, meaning the chapel was 25 feet from my front door. I really, you know, there was really no reason for me Intentional, uh, intentional prayer and work. Benedict also believed in the practice of hospitality. This was the other major thing that you might hear about Benedict. This, when people came, you know, it, biblical hospitality. We know, we've we've read and studied some about that. This traveling, be very different today. You know, you wouldn't just pull up to someone's house and expect that they would let you in and feed you and pray with you. That's not really the way we operate anymore. Uh, I suppose if you went to a Benedictine place of prayer or a communal life place, living place, you could do that. So the idea is that we welcome each other as Jesus welcomed the stranger, that there are no strangers, right? That now that I have seen you, I see Jesus and I'm welcoming the one I see. So hospitality is key to his work. And uh, it's vulnerable and risky, just for the reasons I just sort of alluded to, right? Welcoming others forces us into this space of risk and vulnerability. And uh, I like that because it pushes me when I would much rather just act like I didn't see that, <laughs> which is my normal way of functioning in the world. But with Benedict and the rule, I can remember that is God always calling us to put ourselves in that place, not to be unsafe, beloved, I don't want any of you to ever be unsafe, but as we practice what that means to be open, kind of that heart to heart thing that we can do, we can see with the eyes of our heart, uh, rather than maybe judging or, you know, doing the things that we do when we're a bit frightened or unsure. Or when we think we're in control. That's the other time. That's when I know. When I'm not welcoming others, I've taken on the stance of being God, right? And then I have to kind of reevaluate where I am on that path. But So there are several scholars that I mention here who use the rule of life in their writings. And you may be familiar with some of these. The ones that have directly influenced me, or even the way I came to know Benedict, was through this gal named Gunella Norris. And she's written a book called like The Daily Bread and what was her other book? Anyway, or, or Wisdom in the Ordinary, I believe that's one of her books. But anyway, she uh, took everyday tasks and kind of made them devotions. And uh, as a young mother, I remember reading them and thinking, oh my God, I can't empty the dishwasher one more time or get in the car one more time or make my bed one more time or whatever it was for that particular day. And there would be some devotion about sweeping or cooking or cleaning that made it in my, because when I read, some, often when I read things, they were about oh, kind of spiritual uh, endeavors, right? And they lofty and lots of big words and heavy constructs about theology. But when I read like Gunella Norris's book, they were about things I did, cleaned, made bre make bread, take care of my kids, whatever that was. So it, it made it feel like I didn't have to be uh, a scholar.
who is very well known. We're having some um, unstable internet this morning, so. Um, uh, so Joan Chinister has probably written, I don't know, 15 books on the Benedictine way. It, I mean, she can't help it. It's who she is. And also you can find her. She does some amazing talks, very short ones on YouTube, like seven minutes, just because it's her life. And, and so when she talks, she just comes out. You can't help it. And um, she was a uh, delight. I met her um, when I was in seminary. So, I, and if I had my library here, which I don't, I would have, I have actually those books. Um, I have several of these. And, and there are books in our library for each of these saints I'm about to talk about. So if you want to do a little research, you can go in this library. Also, there's, you know, a collection of books in the kind of vesting area in the, in the church in the back. So if you don't find it here, you might, you might find it there. And, and they're all pretty available in many other places. Are there questions about Benedict that any of you might have? Right now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. Allison, I'm yeah, Sharon. That, um, as I read this, that there was a lake, Subiaco, near Rome, which is where he went. And <laughs> to escape Rome, it's not very far, is it? Right. <laughs> it was Subiaco, Arkansas. And in Subiaco, Arkansas, is a Benedictine monastery. Wow. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. No. And, um, and on that property is an academy called Subiaco Academy. Um, it is a boys' school, apparently run by the Benedictines. And, and one of my students at, at Winston Academy. Left that when he graduated from us, he went there in, for high school and loved it, and is now a, a youth minister. And um, oh, great! Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm just realizing because I thought Subiaco, how did he come up with a name like that? <laughs> no idea. There's a connection, that's isn't there? That's wonderful. Thank and why you. Why the town would be named that? The Benedictines must have gotten there first. Yeah. Yeah, because you know what? I used to only know about Benedictines what it was a, the most delicious sandwich ever made. <laughs> so I was glad to expand my learning of that, right? Well, they must have settled in that part of Arkansas and named, then named the town. Because uh -huh. it surely is, you know, the town wasn't always in need. Right. Right. Didn't they do some kind of monk? I don't know. It's been his lifetime somewhere for the first to be cognac or something? Uh they did. They do have a, uh, you know, early on a lot of monasteries made the most delicious beverage ever, beer. Uh, as you know, because it was important for their uh, digestion, and then later they they found out they could make it a little bit make it a little bit more potent uh, by letting it sit longer. Yes, they did. That's right. Bened yeah, lots of uh, monasteries still do produce beer or bread or uh, wine. So that's why they call it. Beer. All right, so we're going to move on to Dame Julian of Norwich. Um, she's actually not a saint, but she is, a holy, she is considered a holy woman. And here is her prayer. Lord God, in your compassion, you granted to the Lady Julian many revelations of your nurturing and sustaining love. Move our hearts like yours, or excuse me, move our hearts like hers to seek you above all things. For in giving us yourself, you give us all. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So, uh, Julian, we are moving up quite a bit now, another hundred years, I mean, another thousand years, to the 15th century in England. Um, and there's not a lot known about Julian. Uh, so some may be legend, uh, some may be convenience, some may be conveyance. It's hard to know with her, but um, I think if uh, that she lived, to think that she lived during the Black Plague um, that had several waves, much like COVID, uh, that swept through uh, most of England and, the, and Europe at that time. And so, uh, and it took heavy tolls in her community. 
And when I first heard her story through her book, The Divine Revelations, is really her key writing, I knew the principle of God loving me first. And that's, I think, what attracted me to her. Um, all her words illustrate the love of God and God for us. Her practices of contemplation led me to lean into my own practices of contemplation and meditation, particularly centering prayer and silence. So that's, I think, um, if, my, if the rule has given me ways that I continually adjust my relationship with God based on what is the balance of work, study, and prayer in my life, Uh, without, with, as much as I can, without thinking, without planning, without scheming and uh, conniving. I, I, don't, I make it sound like I'm a horrible person. I, I mean, but, uh, but it helps stop that wheel in my head a lot. And here are some words of her wisdom. God, this is one of my favorite. God loved us before he made us, and his love has never diminished and never shall. And in this, he showed me a little thing the quality of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand as it seemed, and it was as round as any ball. I looked upon it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what may this be? And it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. I marveled how it might be. I wondered how it, it might last, for I thought it might suddenly have fallen to nothing for littleness. Nothing is too little. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasts and ever shall, for God loves it. And so have all things their beginning by the love of God. So we don't start from a place of sin and redemption. As lovely as that is, and as necessary as it is, we start from a place of love. And uh, for any of us who may not have had that in spades when we were children, Julian's words were comforting to me, particularly. All shall be well again. Yes, yes. In this little thing, I saw three properties. The first is that God made it, the second that God loves it, and the third that God keeps it. I don't hear anything in there about anything I have to do, anything that was done to me, anything that I've forgotten, or, you know, it's not, it doesn't involve me at all. There's no ego in that, and, and that to me was a blessing mm -hmm. and it helps center my life in God instead of on me. Um, so you can see it's an ongoing work. Of, of Dame Julian's life we know little, only the date of her birth, maybe 1342. Her own writings and, and the revelations of divine love are concerned only with her visions or showings or sometimes you'll see it spelled shewings, S-H-E-W-I-N-G. And she experienced that when she was maybe 30, right? She was called an anchoress. She was attached to a cathedral church. They probably get, I'm not going to ever stop believing. I love that. <laughs> That's a $250 fine for the church. <laughs> Rob's right back there. He can take your check. <laughs> it could be more, it couldn't be any more appropriate. I think, uh, Journey would have liked Dame Julian too. Um, she was ill. How did she come to have these divine revelations? The, the story is that she was quite ill, like very close to death and prayed for death because she was very sick. And in her illness, in her um, fevered maybe self, what, however it comes that she had these visions, these showings where she saw Someone came and gave her a crucifix, and she meditated on that crucifix, and, and about Christ's suffering, and and then, and and I think that's the direction she'd been taught. I think that was the direction everyone had been taught. It was what the church was about, and so in that though she got, these showings were more about how God is in every person's life. And she then became her, the whole goal and practice and work of her life was to pass on these messages, these showings that came to her during that time of her illness. Um, 
I think she had 16 different experiences of seeing God, talking with God, seeing Christ, um, receiving these revelations. I like that it, using the word revelation, points us toward the end of the Bible, right? There's this, this sort of possibility of something more than we had seen in real life, meaning all of this, something beyond that. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I said it right here. It's 15 visions of the passion. And from that time, she says, I desired oftentimes to learn what was our Lord's meaning. And 15 years after I was answered in the ghostly understanding, wouldn't thou love, wouldn't thou learn the Lord's meaning in this thing? Learn it well. Love was his meaning. Who showed it to thee? Love. Who showed he thee? Love. <laughs> Does that sound familiar for the rest of us when we try to get the message? What is it? Love. Our presiding bishop tells us this all the time. Wherefore showed it he? For love. Hold thee therein, and thou shalt learn and know more in the same. And so this thing about love is that it's beyond what we can measure. It's beyond what we can contain. It's, it's larger than anything. And the more we know about it, the more there is to know. And isn't that a glorious thing? So, goes on to say, thus it was I learned that love was our Lord's meaning. Anyway, Julian had long desired three gifts from God, the mind of his passion, bodily sickness in youth, and three wounds of contrition, of compassion, and of willful longing toward God. Her illness brought her the first two wounds, which then passed from her mind. The third willful longing, or divinely inspired longing, never left her. She became a recluse, I've already said that, you know, an anchoress attached to this church where she could receive communion through one window, I mean, this is the way I envision it. I have no idea if this is the way it worked. And then, then, and then she was then we could turn to the community through another window. So she's this go-between, and maybe it's just way too fanciful for me to think of myself that same way. Someone who has this relationship in the church. I love that understanding of how we are all called that way to be both and in that way. Um, so here again, uh, I can make all things well, I will make all things well, I shall make all things well, and thou canst see for thyself that all manner of things shall be well. And that gets used in a number of ways. Uh, it's sort of like bless your heart. Um, uh, there's, a way, <laughs> there's a way we can use it when we want to just stop conversation, and there's another way we can use it to really, I think, as in pastorally to talk about the reflection of how God is in that whatever is happening. And here she says something else. God of your goodness, give me yourself, for you are enough for me. I may ask nothing less that is fully to your worship. And I do ask anything, and if I do ask anything less, ever shall I be in want. Only in you I have all. Julian does not see human suffering as a good in itself, but only as a fact of life and a potential means to union with God. And others have gone on to echo this. Thomas Keating said there is great sorrow or great love. Um, so I think Julian knew this 500 years before our friend Thomas Keating did. Then again, I've given you uh, a bibliography. Thousands of people have expounded on Julian. The latest one, um, is the Mirabelle Star, uh, the showings of Julian of Norwich, a new translation. Uh, so that I, I recommend that to you if, the, if you're looking for something to make it. Mirabelle Star is an interesting case all in herself, but this book is, is, a, is a fun read. All right, questions about Dame Julian. And also she had a cat, apparently. So she shows up in the icons of her. Because I guess you have to have... I, Yes, it's on the north northeast of London, I believe. I think that's right. My geography is not as good as my uh, 
interior life. <laughs> okay, I'm flipping through the biography, and we're coming to Ignatius. It looks like I have 15 minutes, and I think we'll get through Ignatius, and you'll be able to take that work home that's there if, if you want to read more. Here's his holy men and holy women. Almighty God, from whom all good things come, you called Ignatius of Loyola to the service of your divine majesty and to find you in all things. Inspired by his example and strengthened by his companionship, may we labor without counting the cost and seek no reward other than knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Amen. If you get lost sometimes and you go back to the collects, you'll see that the things I'm discussing, the things that impacted me, are actually some of the words from the collect. They're some of the, I guess they're because they're noticeably what each of these holy men and holy women for. Here's a little quote from Ignatius to begin. Let us not pain ourselves again and waste a lot of spiritual energy. The new life is a gift from God. There has to be a flowering that comes from within our very self, from deep down inside us. And when we suddenly flower and bear the full fruit of what it is, we produce otherwise trouble. Not try to prove by our desire and a lack. Lord, give it to us. Bumper sticker worthy, isn't it? Yeah. And um, it's a work of discernment. This is what Ignatian is known. Ignatius is known for discernment. If if Julian is known for love and contemplation, and and Benedict is known for the rule, Ignatius is known for what we've come to know, the spiritual exercises. You may have heard them referred to. Mm -hmm. And uh, the history of Ignatius is interesting because he was a soldier, he was wealthy, he got injured. This, you know, it has its own little legend. Um, anyway, he, he on his recuperation, he learned to read, apparently, or perfected reading. Uh, I don't think you get much time as a soldier to do much reading. So he had time to read. He'd read all the romance. Uh, apparently, they were big in that day. Uh, in that 16th century, romance stories were big. Warring stories, soldiering stories were big. Uh, much like our comic books, probably, or graphic. You know what I'm saying? Like that kind of interest in things. And when he'd read everything that there was to read, he turned to scripture and began to read scripture. It wasn't his first choice, so if, if you're if you're wondering, maybe it's not it's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late. You can always start reading the Bible, although you might find yourself like an order um, that the church despised. Well, he went to some. He did get learning. I mean, he he had a whole pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He did a bunch of things. He finally went went to seminary in Paris. I think I'm remembering all that correct. And then. Um, the church was not happy with him. They did not like this these uh, way he was training priests. And it was right during the time of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. If again, church history, you gotta have the context for that. But he's you know, he's on that hinge of part of his deal too, not that he wanted to not offer mass in Latin, he still did, but he thought learning should be available more widely to people. And he thought that there was a way, through his own way, that the exercises had helped him, that he could see that there was a pattern when we're silent and we learn to discern the questions, that's what he called it, then God will make God's self known and a path might become clearer to you. So for the, you know, for the last um, year or so, I've been working with my own spiritual director about uh, discernment. And, uh, and I thought I was doing so well. I'd she'd given me this book and I was doing all the exercises and I was getting all the answers right. And uh, so I thought, and then I said, I think I know what the question is. And she said, no, you don't. <laughs> Go back home. 
<laughs> you still don't know what the question is that you're even discerning. And I've shared that with Rob and the vestry uh, that I didn't know uh, what the question was quite yet. And I do know now. I do know now. But um, so uh, let's see. He was 37 when he went to seminary. I'm just looking over the notes here. One of the things that I have done long before I even knew the details about uh, Ignatius or the Ignatian way was that I did something called the Daily Examine. And I got it from a little book called Sleeping with Bread, written by uh, a husband and wife and their brother. So the Lins and the Fabrican Lins. And uh, it looks like a children's book because the pictures are colorful and bright, but it is about the examine and how to do it. And it became a way that we structured our life at home. So the examine became really integral in my life. And what it is is this. It's about gratitude, basically. And that was something. And it was an easy thing to grasp onto. The spiritual exercises can be dense, uh, can be difficult. You'll know that people will take 31 days to go off somewhere or three months to go somewhere and work with the spiritual director on the exercises. So it can be, it can be challenging. But the examine... It seemed to me, in looking at gratitude, the examine was something I could actually do myself. And it, it required with me, just every night, thinking about on the things for which I was most grateful. And thanking God for them. And we did it in our family by looking at our day and asking each other, what was, for what are you most grateful today? And it grew from that, because it also began to be a way to look back over my day to see where I might have harmed someone, where I might not have fully, you know what we say in the confession, things done and left undone, mm -hmm. right? So I was able to look back on the things done and left undone and I invite God into that place that I can try to keep to myself. <laughs> Maybe I have all the tools I need to solve it. The examine helps me remember that I don't and that's okay and that's really, really okay. So I've given you here this a little way that you can do the examine every night or every day or at lunch or you know where however that works because um everybody's got their own schedule right and it may be easier for you to do it in the morning or it may be easier to do it at lunchtime or it may be easier to do it if you can do it before you fall asleep um, but you know what if you fall asleep i always feel like well god knows i need to sleep so it's not, a, it's not an opportunity for something else that you've done incorrectly <laughs> or could do better. Um, so there's some directions there. So I would say that Ignatian spirituality is a spirituality for everyday life. It insists, much like Julian, much like Benedict, in our world and active in our lives. It's a pathway to deeper prayer and good decisions guided by keen discernment and an active life of service to others. So uh, what we learn in the discernment, if you're interested, again, I've listed um, some prayers here, but it is a way to direct all of your life, not just big decisions that we make, all decisions that we make. I think another thing about Ignatian that was helpful for me when I've done the spiritual exercises for everyday living, it was a manageable thing that I could do and study with other people. I learned um, the sushi pay, which if you're Catholic, you probably know better than even I do, but it's a prayer, it's called the radical prayer. And it goes like this. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all I have, and call my own. You have given all to me, and to you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. So the shortened version, I've done and highlighted it, you know. Take, Lord, and receive. To you, Lord, I return it. Sometimes if you can't remember the whole thing, take, Lord, receive. 
Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Right? In the Eucharist, it's a very similar pattern. Right? Uh, Rob, in your sermon today, give me only your love and your grace, which we get. Which we get. But there is a surrender on our part. There is a surrender on our part. Now, maybe that's by taking the coal in your lips, <laughs> like Isaiah, or maybe that's just a terrible conscience, like John Newton, um, or maybe that's just a stroke of, like we call it, an epiphany uh, for Peter. I, those, you know, however we receive that, it's there. Or maybe it's in the sushi pay prayer. So um, I've given you the list of books that use the, some that use Ignatius as their broader work. That were uh, Weeds Among the Wheat was one when I first, it's the first one I ever read uh, and uh, really helped me my own discernment to the priesthood. Um, the other one, Seek God Everywhere, that's another really good, Anthony DeMello. These both are Catholic guys. Thomas Green and DeMello are both Catholic. And then Sleeping with Bread, Holding What Gives You Life. Someday I'm going to do a study on that, so I'm not going to give you all the goodies on that one, because that's a good one to get further into Ignatian stuff. All right, I, I think um, I'd be happy to take your questions. I could rush through Teresa of Avila. Teresa lived after Ignatius. She transformed the Carmelite order, which means, it, again, she thought they weren't serious enough. And what is it? It's called, it's called something. They, it, they uh, discalced, they take their shoes off. So she was known to walk barefoot everywhere as part of her sense of devotion. She's been the doctor of the church where the title given to her um, by the Catholic Church some years ago, she was the first woman to receive that distinction. Uh, and her writing survives. This is what makes it interesting, right? 500 years later, her writing survives. The interior castle is uh, what's the best known of her writings. She, um, she almost, almost died several times. She was sometimes imprisoned in her own monastery. The church was just very concerned about her impact on the world. But many of you know uh, some of her poetry. I mean, it reads like poetry, some of her writings. Um, Prayer is an act of love. Words are not needed. Even if sickness distracts from thoughts, all that is needed is the will to love. And then this one, which a Taze song we sing, let nothing perturb you, nothing frighten you, all things pass. God does not change. Patience achieves everything. And then one that's probably most famous is God has no body, hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which to look out Christ's compassion to the world. Yours are the feet with which he is about... He, which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless men now. So again, I think uh, each of our folks, with the exception of Julian, because it's not that well known, but each of them thought that whether it be the rule or the spiritual exercises or study and prayer, these are the things that lead us not just for some sense of interior warm feelings but for a sense of service right? it doesn't just stay uh, that you can discern well examine well pray well um, balance well it's that all that leads toward what that all that leads toward service in God's kingdom in the here and now and to be able to hear what God's calling each of us to do when God calls us to do that thing. And uh, sometimes that's a one thing. Sometimes that's an everyday thing. Everybody's got a story about that, for sure. And the uh, reason that was difficult for me, bounce her ideas off of John of the Cross. John of the Cross. She had a companion. Really? She did, yeah. And both of their writings look toward the cross clearly as a sense of salvation, 
but also in that place of love and our duty to it, if you want to put it that way, the obligation we have uh, that, that God has given us, the very many gifts we've been given. So, And then some books there that might help direct your interest if you uh, know, want to know more. Well, that's it. Yes, here's 12.